thank you. That was beautiful. And um, I'm wondering if Bailey will have as many editorial comments about my preaching as she has had this morning with Jeff's playing. Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, Bailey. And welcome to Bethany on this, our last Sunday here in the Fellowship Center. And next Sunday, we will return to the sanctuary, and uh, we will only be doing our eating here in the Fellowship Center, you know, commencing in September. So um, I am looking forward to it in a way, and I'm also, like, I already know I'm going to miss this setup and this familiar feeling, a comfortable feeling. Um, Please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. Sisters and brothers, let us not be conformed to this world, but let us pray that our thinking is transformed so that we may know and do what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We who are many are made one in Christ. We are called to worship the three one God. Who do we say is our three one God? Our God is the eternal one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, and comforter. Let us worship God together. Our hymn of praise is found in the faith we sing, the little black hymnal, Walk With Me. Almighty God, your ways are far beyond our understanding. Help us to trust your judgments so that we may do your will by loving you and one another. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
You may be seated. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, as your word is read and preached, move among your gathered people, opening our minds to increase our understanding, opening our hearts so that we may bound to each other in your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading, our first scripture reading, is from Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 and 15 through 21. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite the children. Is that James? Do you have others? All right, James. Sit up here. How about? Okay. Okay. Can you get up? Wait. There we go. All right. Still strong. So, I don't know how much you were paying attention to the, the Bible readings, but in the first one, the king ordered some women to kill all the baby boys. And the women decided that that was not okay. So, they didn't obey the king. They let the boys live. They broke the law. So the question is, when is it okay to break the law? When is it okay? Yes. Never. That's, that's a pretty smart answer. And I think you should abide by that for a long, long time. <laughs> Forever. But Sometimes people make rules or laws that aren't consistent with God's love. Like the king who told the women to kill those little babies. That's not right, is it? No. So in that situation, the right thing to do if you love God is to protect the little babies. So. 
you'll have to talk with your daddies about this one to figure out when are the good times to disobey the rules. And I'm guessing that while you're little, there aren't going to be very many, right? You got to abide by the rules, especially your parents' rules, right? Grandma's rules, right? But there will be times when the rules seem wrong. And then you have to pray. You have to ask God. And you have to ask the people in your lives, are, are these rules right? Are they good? Do they express God's love? Because if they don't, we as Christians have an obligation not to abide by them. And that's a scary thought for all of us in this room. Okay? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for children. We give you thanks for their open minds and their open hearts. We pray, Lord, that we may be more like them, that we may become more open to your love and your loving guidance. We pray, Lord, that you will keep this child that we love so much safe and that you will guide and protect him as he learns to understand rules and laws as they interpret your rules and laws for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Computer does not want to. So weird. All right, now, until the last note closed. All right, let me make room here for a minute. Pray with me, please. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and minds to hear the message you have for us this day. Empower us to apply Jesus' teaching to our lives and our communities in our time. Amen. Well, I love the lectionary for this year, the way that it jumps around. Um, last week, when we looked in on Jesus and the disciples, they were in the coastal region between Tyre and Sidon, and they were having a conversation with the Canaanite woman and this week we find them in Caesarea Philippi, which is about 30 miles due east of Tyre. But the scripture that we read this morning was, is, doesn't directly follow the scripture that we read last week. And in those verses, Jesus and the disciples have been on the move. So... I don't have a map. I really wish I did, and I'm probably gonna I'm gonna try to like for you east no east and west. Got it? East is that right? East and west. So Jesus is over here on the eastern side. Yes, eastern side and uh, on the coast. And Tyre is about 30 miles due east of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus didn't walk 30 miles to Caesarea Philippi. No, Jesus went down and down further to the northern part of the Sea of Galilee and then down on the western side of the Sea of Galilee and up the mountain where he fed the 4,000 with seven loaves and two fish and then came down the mountain, got in the boat, and went across the Sea of Galilee to Magadan, and had some conversations there, and he was healing people along the way, and then the disciples caught up with them, and they ended up on the northwest side of Sea of Galilee, and then they traipsed up to Caesarea Philippi. He covered about 50 to 60 miles, maybe even 70 miles, walking around. And frankly, y'all, Jesus went around his elbow to get it to his thumb. Y'all know what that is? He went down and around and up and over this way when he could have just gone straight across. So last week I talked about how 
Jesus had taken the disciples to the area where they would encounter the Canaanites because he wanted them to confront their long-held prejudices against the Canaanite people. And I called it a field trip. And then in our text today, it feels like Jesus has taken them on another field trip. Why did Jesus go all this meandering way and end up, why, was, why did Jesus take the disciples to Caesarea Philippi? Well, it's in ruins now, but the setting is much the same. Located at or near the headwaters of a river that feeds the Sea of Galilee, Caesarea Philippi was built upon a naturally occurring rock out a jutting out rock space, I guess a platform of rock, a shelf, which was backed by a broad, rocky mountain. It was the kind, of, or it is still, the kind of natural space that people are drawn to. There is lush greenery that grows around the riverside at the banks of the river in front of the space cold, clear waters that stream from a fresh spring, natural spring, a mysterious deep cave, and the kind of flat rock spaces that just call people to go and bask in the sun. Now, if you look at the front of your bulletin, there's an image of what Caesarea Philippi might have looked like in Jesus' day. As you can see, there's no river on the front of the bulletin, but that would have been in the foreground in front of the space that's illustrated. And on the left side of the image um, is a temple to Augustus, the first Roman Caesar, the first to call himself Divi Filius, son of God. And behind that temple, you'll see the half moon of darkness of the front of a cave. Now that cave was known as the Gate of Hell, or the Gate of Hades, because it was so deep, so far down in the earth that the people of, those of that day could not plumb its depths. You know, whatever was mysterious and down and dark, had to be hell, right? So it was the gate of hell. Next to Augustus's temple, you'll see sort of a raised flat space um, with, a, with an arch carved into the mountain behind it. And that was the court of Pan. Any of you remember what Pan was the god of? Little G, little G god? Um, He's the god of nature in the wild, um, music, impromptu celebrations, and nymphs. So I leave it to your imagination to consider how Pan might have been worshipped in that space. Next to the court of Pan was the temple of Zeus, and next to that were tomb temples. Caesarea Philippi drew thousands of pagan worshipers, and their worship practices were so bawdy that Jewish priests and rabbis warned their people to stay away. No decent Jew would be caught dead at Caesarea Philippi. So why did Jesus take his disciples there? I think it's another field trip opportunity. In that location, Jesus and the disciples would have been the weirdos. If they were dressed in their normal Hebrew garb, and there's no reason to think they wouldn't be, they would stand out within this mass of pagans, Gentiles, who were dressed in Roman garb, or the normal hoi polloi of the pagan Gentile, those are synonyms, life. That 
is the place where Jesus asked his disciples, in the midst of all of those people, worshiping those gods, who do people say that I am? Well, I guess it depends on which people you ask, right? And you know, for most of our lives, we would be able to say that people, not just in this church, but our community, people say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But now that is no longer true. Some might say that Jesus was just a man. Some might say that Jesus was a very good man or a very good rabbi or maybe even a prophet. And some people will say that Jesus didn't exist and that Jesus is the starting point of the Christian mythology. It hurts my heart even to say that like that. <laughs> I remember the first time I heard somebody describe it that way and it killed me. We may, here and now, for the first time in our lives, have the sense of being the odd one in our communities. Those who still proclaim the love of God and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and life after death, we might only now be able to put ourselves in the disciples' shoes and imagine ourselves among our neighbors being thought of as weirdos, maybe even suspect, because we believe and proclaim Jesus. So as the disciples stood in the midst of that glorious tribute to empire and power and that culture's little g gods, Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? And it's Simon Peter who made the first confession of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, imagine with me, time traveling to that place in time, standing with Jesus among those stone monuments. Imagine the power of empire that they would represent, the intimidation we might feel. And while Augustus and any other Caesar is the son of these little stone gods, powerless by comparison. I don't find it that hard to imagine standing in places where Jesus is not proclaimed as the son of the living God. I think our culture has evolved into a place where the dollar, money, is the be-all, end-all of existence. And that said, I think that we as Christians are called to protest against that and proclaim that the dollar is not more important than people. Cash, profit, is not more important than community. It's not more important than justice. It's not more important than dignity and respect for all people. Despite our culture's behavior and choices to the contrary, the dollar is not God, not a God. It is simply a tool. And we use it to accomplish, we could use it to accomplish great things for God. We could use this tool to mend and heal, to feed and clothe, to teach all the people and love all the people. Or we can use it to pamper and satisfy ourselves. How we use money, which is just a tool, 
says a lot about how we prioritize our faith and our decision making. Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And immediately Jesus praised Simon Peter for his confession of faith. This is where and when Jesus christened him Peter, or Petra, the rock, and added that upon this rock, whether that was Peter's bold statement of faith or Peter himself, this living rock, Peter, unlike the stone lifeless gods that surrounded them, would be the foundation upon which Jesus would build his church, and not even the gates of Hades. Can you imagine being there? Don't you think your temptation would have been to turn and look at the actual gate of Hades that you thought you were visiting, standing in front of? Not even the gates of Hades would, come on back, would prevail against that kind of rock-solid faith. I think that would have been a profound transformative moment to stand among the rocks and the stones that glorify the culture and say, you are the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But then Jesus goes on and talks about binding and loosing. And I confess, I have never really cared for these verses because, you know, it says whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And... I don't like the idea of being bound in heaven. That doesn't sound like heaven to me. So I <laughs> really had to wrestle with this. But what I came up with was that Jesus was inviting the disciples to bind themselves to one another in his love and in the way that he lives in honoring all the people and welcoming all the people and forgiving the sins, loosing people from their bondage to sin, from their guilt for their sin. Loose that and bind people up in the healing power of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And that is bound in heaven. That's what binds us together in love in heaven. And our debt of sin has been loosed from us and stays loosed from us, according to Jesus. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But that brings us to another point. What about the people that we bind in sin, the people we judge, the people we separate ourselves from. What are we doing to the people God made? What are we doing to the people God called us to serve and love and welcome into fellowship if we can't let go of their sin. We have to let it go. We have to let it go so that it doesn't hold them in heaven. That's what love is. It's embracing people for who they are and letting go of their sin. Letting them be free to be loved by God, to know that love in Jesus Christ. That's love. That's faith. 
I believe that's what Christianity is when it is at its best. I think that's who we are as Christians when we are our best Christians. And that sounds like heaven on earth to me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Our hymn of response is number 188, Christ is the World's Light. You may- Affirmation of faith, turn to 885 in your hymnal. A modern affirmation. Oops. All right, that's not good. All right, 885. I'm sorry, I didn't have this marked. Gives everybody else time to find it. (laughs) All right. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. 
we come now to a time of sharing our joys and concerns. Oh, I've got two pens, but I've got to use the fancy one. Okay, our, yes. Yes, let us remember Rob White, that's Susie and Alan's son. He's in the hospital at Duke, and also Miles Kearns, he is at UNC Hospital. I have a joy. Uh, we delivered 310 bags of school supplies to Hillendale, four vehicles loaded full. Wow. <laughs> 210 children's books were given out and 78 bookmarks were chosen. Wednesday evening, we will do pre-K and K. So if anybody would like to join the experience, you're welcome to. Ronnie had his best sleep score ever after, <laughs> after helping lift all those boxes. A 91, <laughs> so. If you are having difficulty sleeping, come Wednesday night. We'll help you out. <laughs> I had a uh, high school classmate uh, pass away this past week of a heart attack at the age of 48. So if we can remember the McLaughlin family. Michael Reynolds, as he recovers from his surgery, mm -hmm. and um, keep the people of Maui and people displaced by wildfires and floods and natural disasters, and also the people in Ukraine, keep them in our prayers. Forgot one. Pastor Lisa is having surgery tomorrow on her wrist, a ganglion yes. cyst. Mm -hmm. So it's being removed as being done as an outpatient. So let's keep her in our prayers and lift her up. Now, it's not a big deal, but I told Gary I'm going to have. I think I'm going to have to do the bulletin for next week this week because there's going to be a bandage here and I might not be able to type. So, <laughs> um, but that is the that is the problem. There's a cyst here, and as I work. Well, it's more than that. It's all the time, but it, it is particularly aggravated and it's been going on for over a year, so we're gonna take care of it. Thank you for mentioning that. And thank you for mentioning Michael. Um, he's doing very well, but his post-surgical protocol has restricted him from showering, so you aren't gonna see him again until he gets to shower. <laughs> so. back on the back. Yeah. <laughs> no. Are there others? <laughs> mm, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to stop there. Um, so following up on Miles and Rob, um, the fact that Miles is still with us is a miracle. Um, he has been, family, he, he has been in critical condition for a long time. Um, and as I have said before, where there is life, there is hope. So keep those prayers coming. Um, Rob is in the hospital with the diagnosis of a brain tumor, and, or several, and um, he'll be having radiation and chemo. And so Alan and Susie and Rob and their family also need our prayer warriors to step up because prayer changes things. Maybe you've experienced it in your lives, maybe you haven't. Prayer changes things. So keep those prayers coming for all of these concerns. And the only other one I would lift up, and Michael, I might need you to help me. I heard the Sunday school class talking about this at the beginning when I was not in the room. The woman who was killed, who was a business owner, can't remember her name. Some of you may have seen it. This was a woman, who, a mother in her, I don't know, 40s maybe, 
mother of, of nine children who had her own business and was flying a rainbow flag in solidarity with the LGBTQ community and was killed because she flew a rainbow flag. And we are called to love the haters in the world. We are called to love the haters in the world. Jesus said, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So we have to pray hard for the haters in the world who would think that that kind of an atrocity was okay. Let us go to God in prayer. Merciful God, we lean into your mercy. We know that we ourselves are not without sin, that we could not cast the first stone. That said, occasionally we reserve for our, ourselves the right to cast the stone of judgment against people for many and sundry reasons, not least of which are the people who are saying hateful things and doing hateful things. We would not bind them in their sin any more than we would want to be bound in sin. And so, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out in our midst that we might be messengers of mercy, grace, and forgiveness in the world. That we might know ourselves as sinners and so offer forgiveness to those who sin against us. Lord, we pray for our church family, those who are suffering in physical need, physical distress, illness, injury, those who are in recovery or hoping for recovery. You are the great healer. We know that you have the power to bring healing upon these folks mind, body, and spirit. And so we pray in Jesus' name that you will pour out your healing spirit upon them in powerful ways, defying the odds, defying medicine, healing from your abundance of love. We pray that we may be messengers of that love for those in our community who are hurting. Lord, we are bold to ask your grace and your forgiveness upon us for the ways that we have fallen short. We confess that we do things we'd rather not do. We do things without thinking. We sin against you and one another, and we pray for your forgiveness. And having received your forgiveness, we pray that we will be able to forgive others. When our words for prayer grow too long or we fall short of what we would say and ask of you, we know that there is a prayer that Jesus has given us that we can pray that encompasses it all. And so we pray it together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Let us continue in our prayers. While we may long to be like Jesus, we know that in our hot-headed choices, our frantic lives, and our impetuous words that we are too often like Peter. But like Peter, we can confess that Jesus is our Lord, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world and its frantic pace, too busy to notice your countless blessings. We confess that we conform to this world's reckless waste, exploiting what you entrusted to our care. We confess that we conform to this world's shallow values, ignoring or denigrating the gifts of those who differ from us. We confess that we conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest over the lasting. Forgive our need to conform to this world, O God, and transform our hearts and minds that we may be conformed to Jesus instead. We pray in his holy name. Amen. Friends, the steadfast love of the Lord never ends. When we call out to God, God answers. God saves us with a strong and outstretched hand. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and helped to live in grace. Amen. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. I'm happy to inform you I tested negative this week so I can come among you and share the peace. Oh, thank you. I'm dropping everything. I think it should, don't you? <laughs> peace be with you. Peace be with you. You look so familiar to me. Do I know you? Well, I haven't, so who needs to turn me on? They say everybody has a point.
to bring the group back together again. Um, we have a birthday today. I, I, I touched it. I did it. It did. There it is. Okay. We have a birthday today. Pat is having a birthday, and so Jeff has queued it up. <laughs> Kathy have an anniversary today. Today. Okay. Special 51. That's what I was thinking because we did the big party last year, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, now having sung and said and heard and prayed the word and the will of God for your lives, I invite you to respond with generosity in your offerings. Holy Lord, we come to you humbled by your generosity, humbled by your gracious forgiveness for us, humbled by your love which surrounds and sustains us in all that we say and do. We give you now a portion of our financial gifts and we ask that you would multiply these in service to your kingdom 
that all may come to know your love and forgiveness in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 568. grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest upon you and abide within you this day. And may you go forth from this place, this time of worship together, nurtured in the love and care of Jesus Christ, that you may serve him in the world. Amen. Amen.